Hi, this year's video is on qualitative data collection techniques. The objectives of this video are to explain qualitative data collection techniques like participant observation, think aloud studies, interviews, and surveys. And we also want to have you identify qualitative, uh, when qualitative data collection techniques and methods be useful to answer a research question. We'll start first with participant observation, which is a type of data collection technique where we can collect qualitative field notes and quantitative data. We can use predefined forms to help us with our participant observation. And participant observation is when the researcher becomes part of the observed group and can observe the activities that participants are doing firsthand. The benefit of this is we can get more accurate data than compared to post hoc self-reporting, which can be typically unreliable. So with participant observation, we make uh, observations in a natural setting or can, the field that we're working in, and we make them over time. We can observe behaviors that may not have been predicted from theoretical models. So if you're starting with an underlying theory, uh, you might end up observing something that doesn't quite fit it. And that would allow for really kind of expanding the theory or maybe using a different theory. There's lots of really interesting things you can find from participant observation. We also can use participant observation when we want to know how people behave in a particular setting. So we could ask them how they think they would behave, but that might be completely different than how they actually do behave in a particular setting. So when we're doing participant observation, we want to focus more on exploration than on hypothesis validation. So participant observation allows us to really explore a particular situation and we don't use it to say, oh, we think this is going to happen in this type of situation. It's not a validation of a hypothesis. It's really getting towards grounded theory. So the goals of our participant observation are to describe the setting. When we do our data collection, we're doing a description of what's happening, what we're observing. So is subject A talking to subject B? Uh, if they're doing pair programming, who is the driver, who's the navigator? We want to understand what's happening in these situations. And then we can start doing analysis of these observations and using counting and other types of techniques to identify what's really happening and get to the how and the why of a particular situation or scenario. And the analysis that we do is supported by multiple confirmations or multiple observations of the same types of behaviors. And that's what we pull out and we start extracting to understand the why and the how. So when do we use participant observation? Well, we wanna use it with small groups. Uh, trying to observe a class of 200 is very different than trying to observe a small group of 10. It's a lot easier to observe a small group. We should also think about doing this on processes that are relatively short. Uh, so we can spend an hour or two in observation, maybe not a whole day in observation. It helps when we can observe events that occur frequently. This allows us to do counting and to start seeing those patterns that might emerge from the participant observation. One of the prime motivations for participant observation is to have that exploratory analysis to really find out what's going on rather than to confirm hypotheses. So if you aren't quite sure of a hypothesis you want to answer, but you're interested in exploring a particular situation, participant observation can give you the ability to do that. And then you might build some hypotheses from that observation later. You should also make sure you have time to do participant observation. It does take a long time to not only sit down and do the observations, but then to do the uh, sort of think, uh, uh, write down all of the stuff afterwards, make sure your observations are done correctly, uh, bringing those notes and everything together so that you can then um, actually start doing the analysis of that data. So participant observation does take quite a bit of time. So here's some considerations for doing participant observation. It's important that you have some type of system or form or uh, structure to what you're trying to observe. This can help you focus in on a particular type of data that will best help address your research goal. You do wanna make sure that you get um, all of that information. So then you can start doing the analysis, start recording things that you think of afterwards. Um, because really doing that information and encoding it and, and putting it in such a way that you can do an analysis later 
that can actually take as long as the original observation. So time is really a critical factor with participant observation. You also need to be concerned and consider subject discomfort. It's very uncomfortable for people to be observed, and so you might find that your subjects aren't quite acting as naturally as they would if someone wasn't there observing. So you also want to allow enough time for a subject to become comfortable with the observation so that they can then get to a more natural interaction uh, in that particular environment. You also want to consider whether or not you're going to be a fly on the wall observer or if you're going to be an active participant uh, in the environment that the subjects are working in. So you need to figure out if you're going to just sit back and take notes or if you're going to engage the students or the subjects and, and have them do particular types of activities. You might actually want to have multiple observers. One might be an active participant, another might be the fly on the wall. And it can also help to make sure that you're getting multiple views of that uh, behavior in this environment that you're working in. You also want to be careful about getting too friendly. You don't want to go native and get too involved and in, ingrained into the research. There needs to be that level of separation to minimize the bias that might occur by going, getting a little bit too friendly with the uh, research study that you're running. Some other considerations are uh, the participation and concealment that you might have as being part of the, being an observer. So if you become an active participant, you're engaged in the research, you may not be able to do as much of the observation because you're actively engaged. So having a secondary uh, observer could be very helpful. You also want to figure out if you want to conceal your goals. It might be that if you let the participants know about the goals of what you're actually researching, uh, they might behave differently. And so using deception as part of the research uh, might be appropriate. And this is something that you can discuss with your IRB. Uh, deception research is a type of research you can run, but it does have to be done very carefully. Uh, you'll typically not have the information about the deception and the informed consent, but afterwards you would tell the participant about the deception and they would have the opportunity to remove their data from consideration in the study later. So deception research is possible, but you do want to be very careful that you're not uh, hurting your uh, subject's privacy and confidentiality, and you're very uh, clear afterwards about telling them that the deception occurred and essentially reporting out about the deceptive uh, part of the research. You also want to think about the ethics of the uh, observation. Um, as you're, you're doing this, this is part of the IRB process. You want to think about, is this something that's appropriate to do? You also want to think about the scope of the observation. You do want to limit it to the uh, relevant behaviors. So you want to be focusing on the behaviors that make sense in terms of the research question you're trying to ask. You shouldn't try to observe everything. You should focus on the things that are critical for your research question. Now, there are some limits to this observation or naturalistic observation. They can be very useful in complex social situations, and they can help us understand the situation and develop theories. They could also help with negative case analysis, where we can have observations that don't fit the pattern. And that might lead to uh, new theories or theories that are sort of diverge from existing theories. Now, a little bit of advice for doing participant observation. You should record the observations on the spot. This is a critical piece of advice. You might think about, oh, I'll remember that later, but you probably won't. So you should record it on the spot. You should make sure that you read through all of the observations soon after the event to clarify and fill in any details that you might have missed because you're trying to write really fast or type really fast. You might have missed a little bit. And if you uh, go through those notes really close to when you did the observation, you can fill in those details you missed uh, very quickly. So you want to make sure you do that within uh, 24 hours of the observation session, and you should do it before you proceed to the next observation session. Uh, if you wait, you'll start getting sessions confused, and then your data will be less reliable. So here's an example of participant observation that comes from the field of software engineering. So suppose you're observing code inspection meetings, and I did this when I was uh, an intern at IBM. I had the opportunity to observe code inspection meetings, though I didn't quite use this particular encoding. 
Um, but the whole idea is that the researcher would observe, they didn't participate in the inspection, and they used data forms and field notes to see what was going on in the particular meeting to figure out the types of defects that were uh, found during code inspection and to really understand how the participants engaged in that particular code inspection. So here's an example data form. The researcher would uh, talk about the classes inspected, the date, the time, the people involved in uh, the inspection. They would provide uh, some idea of their responsibility, the amount of time they prepared for the inspection, um, and if they were actually there. They would uh, talk about how much was actually inspected during the meeting and the complexity of the classes that were inspected. And then they had some codes that would help uh, describe the particular points of discussion that were going on. So for example, if there's a discussion about defects, they would code that part of the conversation using D for defects. If they were having a discussion about uh, questions that people were asking, they would code that Q for questions. So this data form helped supplement some of the field notes that were taken and allow the researchers to focus in on what happens during a code inspection. So some sample field notes would be things like, the step function is very important but complicated. Reviewer one didn't have time to review it in detail, but it really needs to be reviewed, so reviewer one will take a look at it later. So these are really summarizing a lot of the discussion that went on and then anonymized the uh, people involved in this uh, observation so that uh, you weren't giving identifiable information away. Now, one of the things that is very similar to participant participant observation, really kind of a subset of it, is something called a think aloud study. And this is used to gather data in real time rather than retrospective. And this is the opportunity to have participants think aloud as they work on a particular task. So think aloud studies um, work really well with controlled studies where you can have an individual who comes in, does a particular task, and verbalizes what they're doing as they're working through the task. Um, so my PhD student, Brittany, did a lot of think aloud studies uh, around static analysis notifications and how to better uh, write the messages that are happening with static analysis notifications. She'd have developers go through uh, code with particular notifications in varying levels of detail and think aloud about the things that they needed, the questions they had, uh, the concerns they had with those notifications, and she used that information to come up with a model for providing information from static analysis notifications. So think aloud studies are a really great way to um, have participants engage in something and get a lot of uh, rich data from them. You can also use think aloud studies as a way to pilot your research. Uh, so you could have uh, people do think aloud on uh, surveys you might run, or on a research setup to make sure that everything's working properly before you go and run your research um, on a full group for the full data collection. So using Think Aloud uh, is great, again, for having people verbalize things in a controlled setting, as well as having them test out different types of um, research setups that you might have. All right, our next uh, Qualitative, or qualitative uh, data collection is interviews. So again, this is another data collection technique where we have qualitative field notes that are, are recordings of the interviews um, and their responses to your questions. You do need an interview guide to help uh, structure your interview. You can have structured interviews or semi-structured interviews, but that interview guide is really critical to doing a good job with interviewing people. And so you gather data interactively. You'll usually do uh, interviews one-on-one -on -one, um, with subjects. You'll ask some questions, they'll respond, and you'll have a conversation back or forth. Now, if you go to having multiple subjects, you go from interviews to focus groups. Um, so everything we talk about with interviews would apply for focus groups as well. The benefits are that you have a flexible and adaptable way to get information from people. It can be very structured, meaning you ask the same questions in the same order every time with someone, or it could be semi-structured where the conversation uh, might change based on how the interview subject actually answers questions. And it does allow a researcher more freedom to get information than a survey or a questionnaire. It's less um, formal um, compared to a survey or a questionnaire, which might be very rigid or multiple choice. <clears throat> 
So when do we use interviews? Well, when the study focuses on the meaning of a phenomenon to the participant, interviews are very useful to understand the meaning of something to someone. It does allow us to provide individual accounts of some type of process or practice. Um, it also helps to do interviews as part of exploratory work prior to performing a quantitative study. So we might interview subjects to understand something about a particular area and then use that to structure a more quantitative, larger scale study. We could also follow a quantitative study uh, with interviews to better understand the why and the how of the numerical results that you see in a quantitative study. So you really want to be using these qualitative and quantitative pieces together to supplement each other um, as we can think about our research studies. Now, of course, there are considerations for running interviews. We do need to think about the level of structure. Are they semi-structured or structured interviews um, or unstructured interviews? And we want to make sure we have all of that defined in our interview guide. You also want to think about the degree of disclosure of information that you either want from your subjects or that you might yourself be giving to your subjects about the purpose of the study. We want to think about the purpose of the interview. What is the type of information we want to get? We want to uh, think about whether or not the interviewee should have the opportunity to prepare for the interview. Do you want to send them the list of questions ahead of time so they can take notes and be better prepared for that interview? Or do you want them to come into the interview uh, cold and uh, just answer uh, without any type of preparation. So think about whether you need a pre-interview, survey data before the interview, or other information as part of the interview. You also want to think about difficult interviewees. Uh, is someone not going to expound or, or you know, give additional details about the information? If you ask them a question, are you asking a question that can get them to continue talking? Or are you asking something that could be answered with a simple yes or no? So think about how you can nudge the interviewees to get to the information that would be useful for your study. Well, not biasing it. You also want to think about recording your interviews. Do you want to record audio? Do you want to record video? Both. Uh, is it going to be, you know, you're in the room together? Are you going to be over a Zoom call or a Teams call? So think about how you're going to record this information. So tape, paper, etc. Now interviews can be time consuming. So you do need to have the time not only to conduct the interview, but also to transcribe the interview and then later on do the analysis. You also want to think about individual interviews versus group or focus group interviews. So a little bit of advice about interviews. You should listen more than you speak. You're interviewing someone because you want to learn about their thoughts, their opinions. You shouldn't be leading them. You shouldn't be uh, trying to provide that much information to them. You really want to get their insight. You should phrase your questions in a straightforward, clear, and non-threatening way. You should try to eliminate cues that might lead participants to respond in a particular way. You should not appear bored. So practice engaging, looking at the person that you're interviewing, uh, listening to their every word, making sure you're taking notes and engaging with the people that you're interviewing. When doing an interview, it might be helpful to have a second person with you um, so that if you're doing the main interview, you can really engage with the person that you're interviewing and the person who's with you can be working on taking the notes and keeping track of information. And make sure you practice. Again, doing uh, some pilot studies of your interviews uh, so you can practice the flow and make sure questions come in the right order is really important. So an example might be a semi-structured interview so you can get information about how security analysts do their job. Um, so the interview guide can make sure that the important topics are covered. And then you have two researchers, the person who's conducting the interview and the person who's taking notes. So here's an example interview guide. Uh, you want to talk about tool usage, about process, and uh, maybe a general discussion of a typical day. So this gives you an idea about how to structure the interview and the types of questions that you want to ask people. And this is part of, uh, all becomes part of your IRB. So when you conduct interviews, you do have to be careful about interviewer bias. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're not biasing the answers by trying to guide people to a particular direction or have them try to answer you uh, in a way that would make you happy. 
You also want to think about the method of interview. Are you going to have it face to face, over the phone? Um, are you going to have focus groups? Is it going to be online? So there's lots of different considerations that we have when doing interviews. All right, our next uh, qualitative uh, data collection technique is the use of surveys. So again, a way to collect data. We can collect uh, qualitative data as well as quantitative data. And the source of data is the questionnaire where you would ask uh, the survey questions. And so you're collecting data uh, via a non-interactive self-report from the subjects. What's nice about surveys is you can reach a very large group. So you can send it out to thousands of people very easily, much more easily than you can interview a thousand people. The format of the survey can vary. You can ask open-ended questions, you can ask closed questions, and you can get lots of data really quickly. It is typically less uh, time consuming than interviews, and it also allows you to collect things like demographics of the participants. So a way of gathering data um, by asking people is why we wanna use surveys. They can provide a snapshot of behaviors or attitudes and if we take multiple different snapshots of those behaviors or attitudes, we can see how they change over time. So doing a pre and a post survey can be really interesting to see if an inter uh, intervention changed attitudes or behaviors or something over time. Now, we believe that surveys are an important complement to experimental research. Uh, surveys could be the only thing you do, but we really encourage you to consider a survey as a complement to other types of uh, data collection techniques and other types of information in your research. Now there are some potential uh, issues or concerns or challenges with surveys. You do want to think about the response set. Um, so you want to make sure that, you know, if there's a tendency for respondents to respond to all questions from the same perspective, um, or they might get into a habit of always saying agree or strongly agree to a set of questions, um, rather than answering each question individually. So you don't want them to get uh, too monotonous with the questions so that they aren't really thinking about and engaging with a particular set of questions. And the survey respondent must trust the researcher so they're less likely to lie while filling out the survey. Now, one of the considerations for conducting surveys is to actually construct the questions. So this is based on the research objective that you're working on and you want to identify the appropriate questions to address that. These could be things like attitudes and beliefs. It could be things like facts and demographics, or it could be things like behaviors. And the question wording is really important. Uh, they can help determine the quality and accuracy of the responses. So you want to avoid things like uh, unfamiliar technical terms. You want to uh, make sure that you're using really crisp language, avoid stuff that is vague or imprecise. You want to make sure you're using proper grammar in your sentence structure. You want to use simple phrasing so that you can avoid overloading working memory. And you want to avoid embedding uh, leading information in the question. So you want to avoid jargon. You want to avoid double barrel questions that are really asking two things. You should really only ask one. You want to avoid questions that are loaded towards a particular answer. Try to avoid using negative wording. Uh, that can get really confusing. Uh, and watch out for yay saying or nay saying with the questions. So here are some examples of some questions that have some problems with them. So things like, I did not like this new testing tool, and then answering with a Likert scale. Or, do you test and document your code each day? That's a very leading question. Do you still check modules into the code repository without thorough testing? That might make someone feel guilty and lead them to an answer that you want to hear. Or do you think that the statistical variation of the amount of time spent by developers in formalized code review is a problem is a leading question. So again, you want to focus on the research objective and then use that to guide you to the questions that would best answer or address your research objective. You want to think about closed-ended and open-ended responses. Uh, you want to consider your response alternatives. Are you going to label everything? Uh, so for example, with Likert scales, which are the ones that typically go from strongly disagree to strongly agree, are you going to label all the internal uh, answers or are you going to only label the ones on the ends? And you also want to make sure if you have rating scales that you're providing some type of differential so that people can understand the differences between the different levels of rating. You should be very careful with your formatting to keep your response scales consistent. If you have strongly disagree on the left, 
you should always have strongly disagree on the left. I've been guilty of uh, doing that incorrectly a uh, time or two, um, and it's confused students quite a bit. You also want to think about your question order. So you want to ask your most important question and interesting questions first uh, to avoid survey fatigue so those get answered. You should ask your demographic questions last uh, to avoid having people think that uh, sort of take on a particular demographic uh, stereotype when answering questions. You want, uh, you want people to be answering the questions as themselves, not as a representative of their demographics. So ask demographic questions last and uh, group related questions together. Then you should pilot your survey. You should run think alouds um, to see are the questions interpreted properly? Are the people who are doing your survey understanding it the way you intended it? And that way you can have increased confidence that your survey is going to really address what you hope is going to address and answer your research question in the way you think. You need to think about how you're going to administer the survey. You can administer it electronically, on paper, in person, you can send it over email. There's all sorts of ways to administer surveys, but there are strengths and weaknesses to each uh, and it depends on what you're trying to collect. Uh, collecting in-person uh, paper surveys tends to be really good. Having students do surveys in class uh, increases response rate as opposed to sending something out via email. Now, as you're thinking about all of the assessments that you might do, all of the data collection that you might want to do, you want to think about how you're going to validate that. And this is, again, where think aloud studies can really help you understand, um, is your interview protocol good? Is your observation tool appropriate? Uh, is your survey well done? Um, so that you can be, have increased confidence that things are working properly, and you can also minimize some of the limitations, this particularly construct uh, validity with your research. So you want to make sure that uh, you're looking at these things through think alouds, through a review by a panel of experts, doing pilot studies, and then uh, looking at different validities of things like construct validity of your survey questions, item response theory, and multiple choice questions. So there's a lot of resources out there to do a validation of your assessments before you run your study so that you can have increased confidence that everything works appropriately. Thank you.